The Rock and Roll and Coffee Show is brought to you by Retroactive. Retroactive, located at Broadway at the Beach in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, is your source for 70s, 80s, 90s merchandise. If you're in the Myrtle Beach area, please be sure to stop in the store and check it out or visit them online at shopretroactive.com. It's the Rock and Roll and Coffee Show. Yeah, we do. All right, so what is that back there? An Epiphone? It's an Epiphone Thunderbird. Thunderbird. Yeah, I have, a, I have a bunch of guitars. I even I have a Slash Les Paul. I have a ESP. I have an acoustic guitar. I have an Epiphone Gibson Les Paul, but I, I do have a Gibson Les Paul too, the Slash one. Wow. Do you play? No. <laughs> <laughs> I don't recall you ever playing. That's why I'm asking. Um, I played bass and sang with my wife in Nashville not that long ago and that was really fun and i can you know i goof around on bass and when if there's like i i'd I'd like to it's just i want to learn to play guitar but it's i just don't have the time and i and it's it's so hard and i've broken my fingers and stuff like that but bass it's like if there's a gig and they're like hey do you want to play bass i can learn bass on youtube for any song so right so i like i like playing bass guitar i like playing the acoustic guitar but i really don't know no that's so surprising because I know you sang in some bands, but you never yeah, played. Most, in this people have, most people that have heard me sing say you're a much better guitar player. <laughs> but you did that. You like you went for it out in Hollywood, right? Yeah. Uh, the first band I was in was a band called Virgin. And this was way before MTV and Cat House was just starting. And I was playing the Sunset Strip and and doing stuff like that. And then I started focusing more on, on doing everything I could with Cat House and then in 92, I joined a band called Battery Club that I just, I loved. And it was made up of a bunch of guys from different punk rock bands, whether it be Social Distortion or Adolescence or DI or whatever. And we ended up playing a bunch of shows. We recorded four songs and we did a little teeny tour with Offspring. Mm-hmm. And that was just as Offspring was like making it really big. And um, it was, it was fun. It was, it was really good. But the thing is, is like, I like to I I like to work and I hate to work, but I work all the time. Yeah. And when I'm doing music, you know, I was doing it because I really like to do it. But pretty soon, I needed to do stuff that would make money. I still, which is ridiculous, still have these visions of like recording a record or going up and playing some shows. And whenever there's an opportunity to get up and sing, I will. But it just it happens so far in, in between. And and uh, but I really like it. I really really like it, and I get really nervous. You get really nervous. Oh my God. Yes. I get so nervous because of singing or just being on stage in front of all the people. Um, I love being on stage in front of people. I mean, when I go on stage in front of people, like my first thing is, and this is just my own, you know, uh, insecurities is whenever I go on stage, I think when I walk on stage, I'm just going to get people to boo me. So I always get nervous about going on stage Mm -hmm. and, um, and, uh, which isn't like you know I, I went on stage with exodus about two months ago and everybody was the fans are so cool and uh i love being on stage i mean i love going up there and talking to people i mean i really like going up and talking to people and i love sure. singing too I, I i'd like to do it more as long as it's songs that i really know like like sometimes i'll try to sing songs i don't know the words and i'll get all <laughs> Yeah. that's when you start shrinking right on stage when yeah, you don't know the yeah, words exactly <laughs> um so let me ask you this now you grew up in you were mainly in hollywood california area right but oh yeah you, are you from new york no i was it's funny i was born in new york right. but but i'm talking about like um months after I was born, I I came to LA. So, you know, my memories of kindergarten through everything is all Los Angeles. And it's, it's all, if it's not the Hollywood Hills or Hollywood itself, it's within seven or eight miles. I mean, when I lived in the last place I lived before I moved was in Lowell Canyon. And I must've been seven miles from every place that I ever lived. Hmm. So, you know, they say TMZ, but people don't know what TMZ means, the show TMZ stands for 30 mile zone, which is like 30 miles on each side is where everything is. And I was like, I you know, 
six or seven miles from everything in Hollywood. Wow. So you grew up around that whole time. So you grew up with Axel. You grew up with Tammy. You grew up with all those guys. Um, I didn't meet any of those guys until I was in my 20s. Okay. Um, the only bands that I could say I knew in my teens was probably Jay Bentley from Bad Religion. Mm -hmm. Jay, I would say, of the bands that made it that are big, I would say Jay Bentley from Bad Religion. I've known longer than anybody in any band, really. But Tammy, I mean, we were all, you know, in our early, early 20s. And at the same time, when I met Axel and Slash and Gilby and everybody, it was our early, early 20s. Mm -hmm. And how did you guys meet? Well, the way that Tammy and I met was I met Gilby because I wanted to, I auditioned to sing in the band Candy, which was a, right. which was a, like a kind of a pop band, kind of poppy punk band. Wasn't Roxy in that band? Yeah, that's how I met Ryan Roxy. So Ryan Roxy was my first friend in, in, in the Hollywood Roxy. And I would say Ryan was probably my first rocker friend. And from then I met Tammy and then it, it just all kind of moved there. But I auditioned for Candy and, and I was going to take the place of Gilby, which was so talented, didn't happen. And I think I was a little more into heavier stuff than Candy was playing anyway. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Okay, because you were more into the heavy stuff all along, right? Yes and no. I mean, I do. I listen. If, if somebody said, well, what kind of music do you listen to? I listen to a lot of thrash. I love thrash. Mm. I love, I mean, the heavy, heavy. But I listen to, I listen to everything. But to say that I don't like Cinderella, I do love Cinderella. I love Faster Pussycat. I, I mean, I'm a fan of that band. But I also, you know, listen to Exodus and Municipal Waste and, you know, a lot of those bands. And but, you know, now I love I really I guess they're not really that heavy. Yeah, they're kind of heavy. I really love Turnstile and and, um, you know, even the bands that 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 a lot of people from my generation don't like with a lot of the bands that do a lot of the screaming. I like a lot of those, too. Some I don't, but a lot of them I really, really do like. Mm -hmm. And I, I listen to everything. I mean, I listen to old outlaw country and I listen to, I mean, I like my chemical romance a real lot. You know, I listen to just yeah. about everything. I listen to, I would say I listen to, I listen to a lot of old punk. I listen to, uh, but I do, I mean, I would say if there was a music, I, I, you know, I, I don't like to put genres on everything. I mean, if I listen sure. to Iron Maiden or if I listen to, I don't know, Power Trip, it's all metal to me. It's all rock and roll. You know, I really, really like Lamb of God. Mm -hmm. But I also, and I just call, and I like Pantera. It's all, you know, like Billy Joel said, it's all rock and roll to me. It really, really is. Yeah, and yeah. people, you know, they talk about how metal is so accepting, which couldn't be so funny because people really don't like it if you cross different genres. You know, I mean, I think I saw Kicks and Exodus within four days of each other live. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah it's funny how when you get older at least for me you know when i was younger i was it was mainly the rock it was the motley crew the rats the you know that whole scene but as i got older i started to have more of appreciation for everything else duran duran's you know depeche mode you know it's it's funny how that happens when you get as you grow older i mean the one band that was my go-to always was motorhead you know, Motorhead is like, I've got Motorhead stuff all over the house. I've got two Motorhead tattoos, you know, pictures of me and Lemmy over there. And I've got so much stuff. Motorhead was always my go-to because Motorhead was my gateway band because Motorhead I liked when I was into punk rock and Motorhead I also liked when I was into metal. And right. they're just a damn good rock and roll band. Right, right. Now, you got your start, or I don't know if it'd be a big break, but it, you were DJ at Tommy and Heather's wedding, right? That's kind of what sort of got me into knowing some of the guys in big bands. Um, yeah. you know, I was, a, I was dan DJing clubs and this was before I even opened the cat house. I was DJing a bunch of clubs and uh, Tommy and Heather came in and I was like, I was a damn good club DJ. Yeah, and I was gonna say, you must've been kick ass. I was great. <laughs> <laughs> Whoopee. It's like being really good on a unicycle. Okay. Right. I'm a great um, DJ. Yeah, but um, so he asked if I would DJ his wedding, and that's how I became friends with Nikki, and then, you know, submerged into the rock and roll scene, and then I said, you know what, I'm going to open up a rock and roll dance club, and then I met Tammy, and then talked to him about it, and we worked on it together, and that's how the Cat House really came to be. So you and Tammy were partners? 
Mm -hmm. Okay. We're still best friends. We talk, I mean, Tammy and I, honestly, I would say rarely does a week go by without us talking. And mm -hmm. it's been like that forever. I mean, I just, I always talk to Tammy. Tammy is just like, Tammy and I are like brothers, you know, because right. we've been through so much together and we talk all the time. Mm -hmm. Now, what led you guys to open the cat house being so many clubs out there at the time? I mean, what well, there weren't any, there weren't any rock and roll dance clubs. So there might've been other clubs at the time, but nobody was doing a club that played rock and roll without bands. I mean, we had a DJ, okay. the greatest DJ ever, Joseph Brooks, and we had a DJ playing rock and roll. So it wasn't, I see. it wasn't, you know, bands playing. So it wasn't it, so much a live venue. It wasn't it was live, but there were no live bands. And that's when it got really, really big. That's how it, it, it really started. And it wasn't a live venue venue at all. It was, it was, and I always said like, I don't want any bands to play because as soon as a band plays, everybody's going to say, oh, who's playing next week? And if I say, right. no, the dance club, they're not going to go. So we lasted a year without ever a band playing. And then they were like, hey, you know, Guns N' Roses releasing an EP. And they're like, can we do a record release party here and we'll play acoustic? I'm like, okay. And then Tammy's like, well, we want to play too. I'm like, okay. And then Guns was like, well, we want to play too. So we had the first night we had live bands and it was Jet Boy, LA Guns, Faster Pussycat and Guns N' Roses all playing acoustic wow. and everybody drunk and just goofing around on stage and stuff like that. That's a hell of a bill. Yeah, it was fun. Yeah, yeah. So then um, how quickly did it take off? It had already been big at that time. Okay. I mean, when it started, it wasn't big. The second night, I remember we had 59 people there. And uh, but I just kept on hitting the streets and you know, we didn't have social media, so I had to go out and pass out flyers and go to right. every single show, which I was going to anyway, and telling people, go to the club, go to the club. So Tammy would, you know, hit up all the strippers and the mud rustlers. So we had the best looking girls of any club in the world. And then we asked a couple rock stars, and then you know, Steven Tyler would show up, and then he would show up there, see all these girls, and then everybody go, Steven Tyler was there, so then more girls would show up, and it was just like it was, I mean, it sounds like such a cliche thing to say, like, oh, Cat House had the best looking girls of any club ever. And it sounds silly to say it this day and age, but anybody that ever went says it, it's true. And that's what put us on the earth map. You know, all these girls start going. So all these club, these bands start going. And then the next, the next thing you know, it's like, here I am doing this little rock and roll dance club. And every rock star you can imagine from David Bowie to Robert Plant to, you know, Alice Coop to everybody. They're all just hanging out at my club. And, and, and I had this rule, I'm like, no cameras are allowed in. Nobody can bring any cameras because I wanted all the bands to feel like they could do whatever they wanted to do at the time. And because of that, crazy stuff happened. Fun stuff, I bet. Yes, from what I remember. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, I mean, there's some footage out there on YouTube. I've seen some footage of the cat house. Not a lot. There's one. I don't know if you saw it, but it's um, who was playing? It was I think you sang. Tracy Guns was playing guitar. Tammy oh, was, was playing. Uh, yeah, that was Pig Partners in Grime. Yes, that was yes. a fun thing that we did. That we did a benefit to. Uh, I don't remember. I think we we're raising money for leukemia or something. Uh -huh. But it was a good fundraiser, and we raised a lot of money. And um, and it was me, Tammy, Stephen Piercy, Tracy Guns. Kyle, Kyle, and Tig. Bang Tango, yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. was, yeah, and we actually like went out and played Arizona as well. So that was that was a real lot of fun. Well, the video I saw looked like you guys were having a blast. My God, we all, everything I do, if it's not fun, I don't want to do it. Right. I mean, right. It's like things I do are fun, but that's like a two-hour portion of the things. It's the 18 hours that, that are around that two hours. Like everybody says, like, oh, you have your cat house apparel company and it does so well and it must be fun and it is but it's like so much damn work and now i'm starting a coffee company and that's so much damn work and then you know i've also got a radio show i work on fox sports for flat track and um i've got all these jobs that look like really great jobs but you know and they are great jobs i'm very very lucky to have them but nobody notices it's like oh i'm up at six o'clock in the morning stressing about this or stressing about that and, uh, and it gets pretty crazy. Yeah, you had you had posted on uh, social media not too long ago about that, how you're overworked and stressed out. Hey, I am, and, and it's crazy, and that's why I think I'm going to work like, sorry, one of my cats is just here. Oh, um, you're good. That's, that's why I think I'm going, 
you know, my plan is I've got a new project that I'm going to announce on, well, two new projects. I'm going to announce June 15th on social media, which I'm going to announce in, on, in New York city on my birthday. And uh, it's kind of fun. It's, it's fun stuff that I'm very excited about, Uh but um, yeah, it's, it's been, it's been crazy, but I don't know how much longer, like, like in a couple of years, I want to just stop. I want to get off social media and I want to just not do anything. I want to ride my motorcycle with my wife, do nothing. Yeah. Yeah. I don't blame you, man. I mean, cat house, that had to be a lot of work as well as fun. Right. Yeah. But I was drunk most of the time. So. <laughs> I mean, it, I, it, it, it was a lot of fun. The fact that, you know, that, um, that with the exception of CBGB's mm-hmm. cat house, which was never available in stores has sold me more t-shirts than any other rock and roll club anywhere. And you can't buy cat house shirts anywhere except cathousehollywood.com. And so CBGB sold more shirts, but they're available in stores and on Amazon and cat house never was. So to, to, to know that we're like a you know six figure apparel company still, you yeah. know, is pretty cool. Well, speaking of that, I, I like to bring props in. So I have my original cat house long sleeve that is in great condition it is it it's that is in such good condition the the flames are the only thing that took a little wear just because of the folding as you can see but let me tell you about that shirt um that shirt's in great condition that is legit um they did the show pam and tommy and they said we're gonna wear some cat house shirts in it can we get some and i had to sign a release i was like yeah so the tommy lee character and pam and tommy wore cat house shirts and cat house hats and they said there's going to be a ricky rackman character in it can we you know wear one of the cat house vests which were these vests that me and like eight different people had and i said nobody's ever worn those i'm not going to let anybody wear one and we had these cat house patches so they bought um, a cat house patch, which is a big patch. They put it on the back of a vest and then they bought one of those shirts on eBay. So the Ricky Rackman character and Pam and Tommy had one of those flame shirts and then they sent it back to me. So I have the, the cat house flame shirt that was actually worn in Pam and Tommy, which is kind of cool because I didn't have that many of the shirts. Like, like there's a shirt that we made that was Alice Cooper live at the cat house. I want one of those shirts so bad. I don't even have one. Oh, man. So yeah, yeah, that would be a really good one. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, I've had this. I don't even remember how I got it's in this. great condition. I yeah. can you read what's on the tag? Let's see. I'm old now, so it's hard to see. So it's Ricky Rackman Enterprises, I think. No, I think it's a little faded. You're not gonna oh, be able to see. I can see. No, what that says is that says um, Ricky's Private Reserve. Yes. I think it says it on the logo too. Yes, it does. That was that was yeah. uh, that was the name. Ricky's that private I, reserve. Everything cat house fell under Ricky's private reserve. That was that stayed like that up until about three years ago, till I got the worldwide trademark on everything cat house Hollywood. So now everything is trademarked and registered under cat house Hollywood. But Ricky's private reserve was the apparel company back. Yeah, in- yeah I posted that on social media when I was going on on the show's site, and uh, I got like four DMs people asking if I would sell it. Yeah, like I have all the shirts. Some of them I think I might sell, but um, like it's surprising how much some of that's those those shirts go. And the other thing is like like the, the original Cat House shirt, like people are spending so much for that online. And it's like I, I sell them now for like 25 bucks, you know? And I just it, bought one it, today. It's not vintage. Oh, good. Thank you. It's not vintage, but it looks just like the original. Mm-hmm. And the, shirt, the t-shirt quality is 10 times better. You know, so, yeah. but it's, you know, as, as much as I like to make new stuff and new designs, you know, and then Slash plays out here and he's wearing that shirt, the shirt that you just bought and people still wearing that shirt. And I think because it was never at st- available in stores, that's why people still like to get that shirt. And when mm-hmm. I go to concerts and I see people wearing them, it's like, man, it makes me feel so good. It's really cool sure. because. Because it, it's it's in my office that that shirt was folded and shipped out, and it's just it's really cool. Did you ever think when you started the Cat House that that brand would last up oh, this long? Hell no! If I did, I would have allowed cameras in there. Um, <laughs> I had no idea. I mean, a matter of fact, when the Cat House closed, and sorry, let me close my mail thing so it doesn't make that noise anymore. 
So I got to put on my old man glasses right now. <laughs> I need some. Uh, God. Okay. Let me close that. Okay. So um, when the cat house closed in 92, then when I got off MTV in 95, I had a garage sale and I had all these like cat house bumper stickers and cat house keychains. I just threw them away. Oh. And they were so much money right now. Mm. Cause I never thought it was like, I was kind of, it was for, for the cat house closing, even though I closed it because I felt it needed to be closed, but it was still an ending of an air for me. Cause you got to understand before the cat house opened, I didn't have any money. Sure. You know? And I was just this drunk, drugged out guy in Hollywood. And then for the cat house to become this, this entity that got me my job on MTV. And, and I mean, my license plate on my car says cat house, you know, I'm still, I'm so proud of the legacy of the cat house now i mean i'm i'm so proud of it. i'm you know I, i'd rather people really dig the brand cat house more than ricky rackman it's just mm. it's really cool and um you know when i when i when i started this small batch coffee company i didn't there was different names that that, that i was running around thinking of what i was going to call it and i didn't want to start a rock and roll coffee company because mm. every band Every band has got their own coffee license. They just license their name and they just throw the coffee. I right. wanted to start my own coffee that I was there for the roasting, that I went to South America and looked at beans, that I did worked on the bags, everything. And I didn't know what I was going to call it. And I'm like, I'm going to call it Cat House. I'm not going to put the words rock and roll on it. I'm not going to put anything on it. I'm just going to call it Cat House Coffee because I, I have, I love that brand. I love the name so much. And I'm using the same exact logo and, but it doesn't say anything like heavy metal or rock and roll coffee. It's just damn right. good coffee, you know? Right, right. Well, let's jump ahead a little bit and then we'll come back to, to your headbanger ball days. Tell me about the coffee. Now you said you went to South America and I went to Central you, America. Central, went to Central America. America. I've, I've been a coffee fanatic always before i mean i remember when i was a kid there was one place that used to roast coffee and i used to go in there and it was the coffee roaster and i used to be like this is amazing and i never had fresh roasted coffee and it tasted so good to me and i was always trying different coffees and then i i, I got married to a french woman who they have coffee differently in france and then we went to costa rica and we went to some plantations and the more we did it and then I just saw all these bands coming out with coffees and, and, right. and, and I started sampling them all and some of them were really, really good. And then a couple of the companies said, Hey, why don't you just do cat house coffee or headbangers brew or, or Ricky Ragman is. And I was like, I'm not going to just sell my name. I'm like, why don't I just start working with a local roaster and make coffee? And we just kept on going back and forth, back and forth with a couple blends. And then we came up with one that is just the best damn coffee I've ever had. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to try it. I'm going to, I'm going to have it roasted. I'm going to design the bag and, and it's Leah and my company, and we're going to take care of fulfillment. And uh, we launched with 95 bags just to my, it was two different blends. It was a hundred bags of each blend. And we sold that in like two hours. So nobody's ever mm. tried it yet. So who knows if anybody will buy it again, but I really, really think it's good. And, you know, we're about to launch it, you know, in a couple of weeks and people can just, you know, buy it. And then I want to hear if people like it or not, because it's, it's something that is very hands-on. I mean, mm -hmm. we don't have somebody doing the artwork for the bags. We didn't have anybody, you know, telling us what to do. We came up with the blends that, that we really liked. And, you know, I learned so much and we we're taking some classes to learn even more about the industry. And uh, it's just really fun. I think coffee is, is, is very sexy. I think when I see them roasting coffee, I'm like, wow. And when I see coffee, just, but I mean, let's be honest, there's a lot of freaking snobs in the coffee industry. Mm -hmm. It's like, people are like, this is made with angels tears and it has to be <laughs> blended through this virgin clot. I'm like, I, want go. I just want a cup of coffee. And I <laughs> remember the other ways, but you know, most of the people use a drip machine. Most of the people can't be bothered. A lot of people buy their coffee at a supermarket and that's fine. You know, the best mm. coffee in the world is whatever you like drinking. Mm. You know? mm -hmm. yeah, I hope that people like cat house coffee. Yeah, well, I'll definitely pick up some. I like to try all kinds of coffee. Um, you know, I've had a few guests on this show. Um, Keith Nelson from Buck Cherry is a big coffee guy. Uh, Paul Gar Gargano is a big coffee guy. Um, I need to pick up my knowledge on coffee, to be honest right. with you, because this is the rock and roll and coffee show. 
coffee right behind me sign. Um, but yeah, there's so much to know about coffee, like real coffee. There is. And, you know, there's so much about whether it's sustainable, how it's grown, how it's prepared. But the truth is I received boxes and boxes of all these bands. It's like, I mean, it was, I could just go on and on and on about so many bands, you know, like here's Kiss Coffee, here's Skid Row, here's Dee Snyder, here's Alice Cooper, here's Disturbed, here's Rob Zombie. And I'm just like, <laughs> And you know, I, I use this quote like, "Don't you think this coffee bit's done got out of hand?" Which is a takeoff on a Waylon Jennings quote. And it is. It's like everybody did it, and everybody did hot sauce, and everybody did this. And, and it's a shame because we were going to do hot sauce, and um, because we love hot sauce. But this is not a licensing brand. This is this is a a, a coffee that's very hands on, and it's a small batch, and and um, I'm very very proud of it. And if nobody buys it, at least I've got coffee for a while because uh, I, I drink it and I, it's my favorite coffee. That's awesome, man. Hey, so, all right. So let's go back to Cat House. Now, when you closed that, what was the reason you closed it? The scene was dying. It was, I didn't want it to be like, well, here I'm at the Cat House and nobody's here. Mm -hmm. So I had felt that the scene was dying then. And I felt that it was time to get out. And I, you know, I had a great career with, with Headbangers Ball and I had done radio at the time. And I was just like, I don't want to see it die. So the last night I had, um, I think Dangerous Toys played, but I know Motorhead played. Motorhead played the last night. And I remember it was the last night of the cat house. And I was like, I don't even want to be in here. It was just so, it was so tough. And then we, and so I apologize for cats and parrots and everybody's making noise in the background. Um, I've, I've had worse. <laughs> um, it, it, and then I did, I did a cat house. I did a cat house fifth anniversary. I did a cat house 20th anniversary. I did a cat house 30th anniversary. I did a festival cat house live that had 15,000 people at it. So, um, you know, it was fun. I almost had another cat house festival going on, but some agents screwed the whole thing up and did mm. some stupid shady shit. And the bands were just like a couple band members had just such lame attitudes. And it was like, Hey, sorry, Ricky, it's just business. And I'm like, yeah, fuck you. you know, yeah. Like, yeah. 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 That's what it was. And, and I was going to pay them more than they were getting paid. And now they're playing on a Wednesday night in a local club. <laughs> well, screw you. Back at you. There you go. All right. So were you on Headbangers Ball at the same time you had Cat House? Yeah, I opened, I started Headbangers Ball in 90. And right. Cat House did open another two years. Okay. So because I was the guy on Headbangers Ball, Cat House got even bigger because everybody yeah. knows the guy on Headbangers Ball. He's there every Tuesday night. So so Headbangers Ball got even bigger. I mean, Cat House got even bigger, but I, I came to Headbangers. I mean, we even shot several episodes. You know, we had Megadeth and Primus and a couple other bands play the cat house for an episode of headbangers ball. Hmm. So that you were kind of using them both to market the other. Hell smart. yeah. Smart. Oh yes. Yeah. Everything I do kind of, I think helps each other, except I, most of my income comes from motorsports and hmm. I try to put in some rock and roll ties in motorsports, but um, yeah, headbangers ball helped cat house and maybe cat house did some stuff for headbangers ball. And who knows it, it was, it was all pretty awesome. It was, I was busy and doing well. Yeah, yeah. So now I heard that Axel did help you with that audition, right? He got you in the in the door for Headbangers Ball. Yeah, he called MTV. Yeah. He called MTV and he said like, "Hey, do you want to?" And then he asked me, he's like, hey, "Do you want to go to you know New York to audition for MTV?" I'm like, oh, "Okay." So Axel flew with me and we went to New York and we hung out in New York and we went out to dinner one night with all the big wigs at, at MTV, and then I got the job. Yeah. Now was that a one? one audition and you got it or was it i was so it was an audition and then they were bringing me in as like man of the street and like i would do little segments here and there and i wasn't very good and uh but then they brought me back to host the show and i still wasn't very good but you know it, it, i guess it got a little bit better some would say it didn't and <laughs> um and then it was just, then it was just uh it just blew up you know it just right blew up and one was one thing I remember, uh, Ricky, from watching you, because I used to, we used to jam at our warehouse 
and we had to be back at somebody's house at midnight to watch the ball, get some beers and go watch the ball. Right. And I remember it always appeared that you were having fun. I was. I mean, yeah. the thing is, I today, I look back and I don't think I realized how much fun I had. Mm. Like, I think I should have enjoyed it a lot because you got to understand if you're this young kid and, and, and you, you get this club by promoting, I didn't open cat house with money. I started promoting this club and more people came and I put more money into the club and then kept on going, kept on going. Then you get uh, a radio show and then you get a TV show when you've gotten the biggest TV show, rock TV show in the world. And then you're like the face of heavy metal. And then you start doing all these things. And it's like, Holy crap. Like I can't lose. It was just like more and more things start happening. And, um, and I, I didn't appreciate like, Hey, it, it, it could go away really quickly. And it yeah. did. And it did. Yeah. Like really quickly. Right. Just was done. Well, I got into talk radio and I was very, I probably made more money than doing talk radio. And, uh, and then I beat up a DJ and went to jail and lost everything and then got out of jail and, and broke and had no money and had to get a job selling cars. Were you a good car salesman? Terrible. <laughs> I hate the concept. The way a car salesman makes money is by ripping people off. The more they rip the person off, the more money they can make. And the thing that sucks is, is like if I sold a, you know, $60,000 BMW to somebody, you know, then they think like, oh, but the car salesman probably makes about six grand. It's not like that at all. I mean, sometimes you could sell a, a big expensive car and make, and they call it a mini, you might make like two, 300 bucks. You know, it's yeah. not that much money to be made in car sales unless you really rip somebody off. But very rarely could you sell a car and make more than like a grand. I don't know if I ever made a grand selling a car. Hmm. Hmm. <clears throat> now I know um, back in the day, you had mentioned that you were into the drugs and the alcohol. Mm -hmm. um, but you've been sober a long time, right? Like 30, 35 years or so? Like 30, how could I not know? I've a think long time. 34 years, 1989, however many years that is. 34 years, yeah, a long time, 34 years. Man, yeah. that, that's fantastic. But that's you know what's weird? There. It's like, I have a really, really bad memory and I think the drugs is one of the reasons and the other reason is just getting old. But the thing is, like, I know I have that same problem. I know what whiskey tastes like. Like, I can still taste it. I know what cocaine tastes like. I know what crystal meth tastes like. Like, I can still taste it. And uh, the whiskey I miss, I ain't gonna lie. I, I'll be here sober saying, Do I wish I could drink whiskey? Yeah, I do, but I can't. I'll, mm -hmm. It'll destroy mm -hmm. me. Mm -hmm. um, but the drugs, I don't, I don't, I don't miss drugs. I don't mm -hmm. miss doing speed. But I still remember exactly what all that stuff was like, even though it's that many years ago, there's a lot of stuff that I don't remember, but I do remember what it was like being on drugs. And even though I don't necessarily remember what happened from all my drinking, I remember being just a complete pass out drunk. Mm. Was there a certain moment that you realized that, Hey man, I need to stop. Yeah. I was going to kill myself. I really mm. wanted to kill myself. And I was in Hollywood and I was, you know, I made bad choices with women and I made bad, which I continued to do when I was sober too. But um, I just, uh, I just, I was just, you know, I just fell apart. Like everything caved in and I wanted to die. And, and I, you know, at that time, people like Nikki were getting sober who ended up getting loaded after anyway. Mm -hmm. But, you know, there were people that I knew that were just interested in getting sober and I mean, I know a big rock back then was Steve Jones from the Sex Pistols. And he was one of the first sober guys that I knew. And, and Steve was cool and he was sober. So I'm like, okay, let me just go to some meetings. And then I started going to meetings and got a drug counselor. And then I became addicted to staying sober. Mm -hmm. Like, as you know, when you drink, you keep on drinking or keep on doing drugs and keep on doing, keep on doing. And then I became the same way with being sober. Like, okay, come on, man, let's just do one more day. Like, I would say, okay, I don't know if I'm going to stay sober New Year's Eve. Just let's just make it through New Year's Eve. And then New Year's Eve would go and I go, oh, okay. Well, I know my birthday is going to be tough. And then my birthday would come and go. And now it's just like, it's just, it's, it's the way I live. Do I still think about it? Yeah, once in a while I do still think about it. Look, Steven Tyler's got, you know, yeah. loaded it recently. Mm -hmm. So nobody is impervious to the demons of alcohol and drugs. But right. um, 
you know, right now, it, I, I believe that the second, if I took a thimble full of beer, I would not be able to keep the cars I have, the house I have, the wife I have, the life I have. I mean, mm. right now I've got things really good in everything and I know I wouldn't be able to, and it still trips me out sometime to walk around my house and think of like, I got all this doing what, you know, right. this, it was a lot of hard work, but it's not, you know, I'm not a hedge fund guy and I'm not an investor. I'm not altogether that smart, but I was able to do all these things and able to buy this house. Yes. So kind of, kind of cool. You know, I mean, people can say whatever they want about me, but I work my ass off. I still work my ass off and you know, whatever I'm doing is working. And I Definitely. never, I never, ever did something, um, against what I believe in, you know, when, when, when I've, I've never sold out my integrity for money ever, anything, mm -hmm. if I say something, if I say I like a band, it's because I like a band. And if I don't like them, then I won't say anything. I didn't see the, the, the benefit of talking crap about anybody, but you know, you, you yeah. did that on the ball as well, right? I couldn't say anything bad about anybody. Yeah. And, yeah. And kind were, of yeah, there were a lot of bands that I did not like yeah. on the Headbangers Ball, but there were a lot of bands that I really loved on the Headbangers Ball. So if you're playing three videos that you don't like, and then you play this band that you really like, and then you're saying, oh my God, I love this video <laughs> from Suicidal. Oh my God, I love this. This dancing video is my favorite band. Oh, the London Choir Boys are such a damn good band. It's like, dude, what a kiss ass. Am I really a kiss ass? <laughs> Could it be that I just hated those other three songs? Right. So so excited that right now we're playing this band. Right. I mean, that, that's the truth. That's what it is. And, and people just love, like, like, you know, they love to hate on me, but back then they spent more time on it. Like you had to go and get a paper and a pen and write a letter and stick it in an envelope and buy a stamp and mail right. it. Right. You know? Yeah. So, so if they hated you, they really had to hate you to go through that. They, at least they hated me, but put a little time and effort in hating. Right. Just, <laughs> you cut your hair. You suck or whatever so <laughs> um now what you know one thing i noticed too with the ball you got picked on a lot well by who well there was sometimes um who was it somebody smashed a cake in your face yeah that was friends that was bio yeah, yeah 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 um there was a couple i can't remember right off the top of my head but i remember well, there was a couple the times people people are stupid okay <laughs> When I'm with my friends, what we do to say we love you is we take the piss out of you. Sure. We bust your balls. We don't say, hey, Keith, what a, man, you're looking good today. You make fun right. of each other. So if Biohazard threw a cake in my face on my birthday, it was out of love. And if you want to ask any of them, they would say the same thing. And right. Dave Mustaine gave me more heat than anybody. Yeah. And in an interview about eight months ago, Dave said the reason that he did it is he really wanted me to succeed. And he was really, really tough. And Dave was tougher than to, on me than anybody was. Mm -hmm. And Glenn Danzig, everybody's like, oh, Glenn wanted to throw you in the fire. Yeah, you stupid idiot. Did you know that two months ago he played my birthday party? Mm -hmm. It's like the people like Glenn Danzig and Dave Mustaine are the people that everybody said, oh, they hated you. I'm like, no, they did. First of all, if they hated me, they wouldn't be on the headbangers ball. I would make sure, sure if they, hated me, they weren't on the ball. And you got to understand, these are people that are my, like my real friends. Like not like, hey, I'm hanging with my good friend, Dave. It's like, no, these are my friends. When Dave had a wedding reception and I was like the only metal guy there. Or when, you know, Glenn Danzig is, decides he wants to play blues in the back room at one of my clubs. You know, you don't do that to people that you don't like. These are people mm -hmm. that are my friends. So they know they can take the piss out of me. And when I got my hair cut, after having hair down to here, I just happened to go to Germany with Megadeth and then do a show with, I mean, go to Germany with Danzig and then do a show with Megadeth. So it's like, yeah. oh my God, I'm going to give Ricky such a hard time for cutting my hair, you know? And and, and that, that, that was always another thing that, that was always so funny to me because people are like, dude, you sell out, you cut your hair. It's like, wow, you are so stupid. Do you realize that everybody, including every person at MTV said, do not cut your hair. Do not cut your hair. You're the face of metal. Don't cut your hair. And I still said... And I cut my hair anyway. Yeah. Tell me how that's a sellout move. If anything, it's doing, you know, I thought that what we're, that what we like to do is we like to rebel and we like to do what people tell us not to do. 
well, everybody said, don't cut my hair. And I still cut it. Mm. And, um, but that was, a, it's like, you know, oh, and then he wasn't metal. It's like, oh, and, and then all of a sudden Metallica cut their hair and Soundgarden and everybody cut their hair. And it was just, it was just, oh God, it was so stupid. <laughs> so when you left the ball, I, I don't know your timeline, but you were on Loveline a little bit, right? You started yeah. that. Mm -hmm. Was that, was that after the ball? No, oh, I did Headbangers Ball and Love Line at the same time for a while. And then I remember one time it was it was crazy because I would do I had to go do Headbangers Ball. I lived in L.A. I wouldn't move to New York. So I lived in L.A. and I had to go do Headbangers Ball and I had to do it at seven o'clock. No, I had to be there at like eight o'clock in the morning to do Headbangers Ball. Now, eight o'clock in the morning, wow. is five o'clock in the morning, L.A. time. Right. But I had to do Love Line that night, which is on at midnight, which is actually three o'clock in the morning, New York time. So I so I get to New York and I do headbangers. I do Love Line from a studio. And this was only like twice a month that I had to do this. And I do it in the studio. And then two hours later, I'd have to wake up and do headbangers ball. But mm. but I did Love Line five nights a week for many, many years. And that was great. That was a really it was just me and Dr. Drew. And, and then uh, after, for a little bit, it was me, Dr. Drew, and Adam Carolla. And that was a great gig because that really taught me about radio and taught me how to think on my feet and deal with live callers and stuff like that. I really enjoyed doing that show. Mm -hmm. And then you started your own show as well. Yeah, I really right? enjoyed doing that show, but I wanted to do something else. Right. So I decided to start my own talk radio show, which I did called the Triple R. Which is now a podcast or was. You still do it? Was, Done it. I haven't done it anymore. I mean, I it's I have so many pod. I mean, the Cat House Hollywood podcast got half a million downloads, and I just released an episode for on May eighth, and now it's almost June. I still haven't released another episode. That was I've a Motorhead one, episodes. right? Yeah, I've got all these episodes that are archived that that I'm that if, of any of the things that I'm proud, of, I'm really proud of the Cat House Hollywood podcast. That I do need to put them all out again. Yeah, but I've been like so crazy busy, and now I'm getting ready to do this big motorcycle ride. So it's like I have even less time. Yeah. And you, you started another one. What was that? Hot biscuit and croissant. That was so much fun that I did with Leah. Yeah. Yeah. Hot yeah. Biscuit, croissant, which I kind of want to do that too. And that one, I mean, people can still find them on the internet. They're like a year old. Mm -hmm. it was just her and I, and the crazy situations that we're in and we'd have guests on, we had Nita Strauss. We had yeah, Doyle Doyle. Mm -hmm. And I don't remember who else we had on maybe Zach. I don't remember. But we always had fun. Doyle's such a good, and Doyle is such a, I mean, it's so weird. People see what Doyle von Frankenstein looks like. And then they know him like, Doyle's a sweet guy. He's the most menacing, scariest looking dude I've ever seen. But it's like the nicest guy. It's like crazy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I was going to have him on this show, but I didn't. I, I'm not going to get into that. But um, I don't know him. He seems like a nice guy. But he does look pretty menacing. <laughs> And he's and the dude is like jacked, and dude has to be in the sixties, mid sixties. Right, he's in the Misfit, and he's a vegan, yeah. and he loves animals, and he's like gnarly. And yeah. I'm like, I'm a uh, as far as I'm a big fan and friend of Doyle. Like Doyle is a very good person. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I love how Elias says his name. You guys were going back and forth with that on the show. That's funny. I don't even remember. Which she with the what she say the fawn the f fawn Frankenstein yes yeah. <laughs> that was my wife is French yeah so, yeah and then she, and we have we have hard like if you listen to the hot biscuit and croissant podcast there's certain words that she has problems with and mm. sometimes I correct her and sometimes I don't I just think it's mm. fun to hear her say I'm like like whenever she says focus she says fuck us like <laughs> that's how she says she said well you know when we go to this thing and we just have to, have to fuck us and I was like. I don't understand. She goes, they have to fuck us. I'm like, I got no idea what time. She goes, you know, fuck us, fuck us. I'm like, I don't know what you're saying. She was saying focus. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if she's listening to me right now. She's gonna come down. Can she hear you? I don't think so. <laughs> Can you hear me? No. She doesn't know what we're talking about. No. <laughs> um, all right. So we did Love Line. And then after that, you got into was it wrestling first before the racing or you know, I did Triple R, and then I got fired because I <clears throat> got in a fight from the Triple DJ R. Thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then I got picked up to do a little bit of work with World Championship Wrestling, which I really didn't get to do what I wanted to do because I love wrestling. 
And then from wrestling, I didn't do anything for a long time and went broke and selling cars and trying to make ends meet. And then I got a, started this radio show. I always loved NASCAR. And I started this radio show. And then the radio show got syndicated nationally. And then I started doing stuff on Speed TV and NASCAR.com. And I was like, all of a sudden, like Ricky Rackman was a NASCAR guy and was just working in NASCAR. And then some of those shows went away, but I still kept on doing this. I mean, I've been doing this radio show once a week for 19 years. Wow. And, um, and then I worked for a couple of NASCAR racetracks. And then I just started working for the American Flat Track Series, which is um, motorcycle dirt track racing. So, you know, June... 10th or 11th i'll be in laconia new hampshire and then in Sep then i'll be in august i'll be in rapid city and then september springfield illinois and i'm like the pit reporter and you can watch the racing on fox sports so i'm back on tv talking about motorcycle racing and it's like like that's pretty cool you know yeah, that's but really cool and and the thing is it's like with nascar and with flat track racing i love these sports so much so it's when i'm at a flat track race and I'm talking to riders. And then when I'm not talking to riders, I'm watching racing. I'm like, this is the most exciting sport, it, most hair raising sport ever. I mean, it's it's just like, you know, if, if somebody offered me a job to do the same thing with baseball, I couldn't do it because I just, I just don't, I don't care. About yeah. baseball. Mm -hmm. um, how did you get into the racing in NASCAR? Where, where I just you love racing. It's like, how did you get into rock and roll? People love rock and roll. I never took, I was never into stick and ball sports as a little kid. You know, I always, I knew who Richard Petty was and I liked go-kart racing. And as I got older, I just started getting more and more into racing. And, you know, even back when I was on headbangers ball, I was a hardcore NASCAR fan. Mm -hmm. And I just went to races and I was like, this is really cool. And now, you know, last week I was at the track interviewing drivers and all of the drivers know me, but they don't have any clue what I used to do. Like, they just think I'm like this old guy with tattoos and crazy hair that is fun to get interviewed. Like the drivers like to be interviewed by me because they don't know what I'm going to talk about. But, right. you know, some of their fathers or pay crew know who I am. I mean, the guys in, in flat track, I don't think really have any idea what I used to do. I mean, one of the drivers, I remember Brad Keselowski said to me, he goes, dude, I saw a video of you with Nirvana. He's like, what did you used to do? You know, like, like they had no idea. These guys are younger. Oh my God. Like put it this way. There's two drivers that I was working with a couple of days ago that I like a lot, Todd Gilliland and Harrison Burton. And I realized that when I'm interviewing them, they can refer to me as somebody born in the 1900s because these guys were all born in the 2000s. Isn't that blow you, you blow your mind when you talk to people like that? It sucks when I see an old person that tells me that their dad used to watch me. I mean, it's just <laughs> like, it's happening all the time. <laughs> that, that because I because I never had kids, I never got to see the process of somebody getting older and older in front of me. So I perpetually thought time stands stood still until you're in your 50s and you still think like, oh, if I got this, people would say, it's so great that he did that at a young age when it's it's not that case anymore that, you know, that now I get up and my knee hurts because I it just, it just hurts, just you hurts, know, yeah. like, like stuff is happening and it's, it's starting to happen a lot now. And it's, uh, it's way, it's weird and it's scary, but it's, there's, there's nothing I can do about it. Yeah. Yeah. Were your parents into racing or did you have friends that were into it? I mean, that's what I'm curious about. It's how my friend, one of the guys that I used to hang out with was into racing as, as well. And we okay. went to our, we went to the Daytona 500 and I, I learned later in life that my dad actually was a little bit into racing mm -hmm. um, and used to take pictures of, of stock car racing back in like the early fifties, but wow. nobody was really into racing. I mean, basically I was a redneck living in Hollywood. I mean, I loved NASCAR. I love Southern food. And, uh, it, it was just, you know, when I, and even back in when I did, I mean, you know, when I did headbangers ball, I wore a Hank Williams shirt. Right. So I've always liked right now I'm wearing a Waylon Jennings shirt. I see that. So yeah. Yeah. Just like I've always liked part of that culture, even though I'm from Hollywood, which just seems like su such a contradiction. So does that feel good to be where you're at now with all the racing around there? 
Yeah, yeah, yes. Yes, it does. I mean, the, it's not as big as it used to be in North Carolina. But I also, like, when I lived in Hollywood, I'd see people in bands all the time. And I just, that's just what you did. And now I see drivers all the time. I'll be at Lowe's and I'll see a driver or I'll be in my office, which is in the same building as these helmet painters and I'll see drivers. And it's, it's really nice. I mean, you, I live on a lake and, and on the lake during the week, there's a lot of drivers that go out on their boats on the lake, you know? Mm. So it is kind of, it is kind of cool, but it's the sport slowed down a little bit in the past, probably 10 or 15 years, but I think it's picking up. Mm. They have that, still have that big track out there by the mall yeah charlotte motor speedway mm -hmm. it would, mm -hmm. i was just there last weekend and okay. uh and the, the, the neat thing about living here is is it doesn't take me that long to get to nashville it doesn't take me that long to get right. to, or it doesn't take me that long to get to new york and how yeah. half your friends are probably in nashville now <laughs> there's a lot of like ace lives in nashville and uh you know there's quite a few tony higby there's quite a few people that, that live in nashville that are good friends and yeah. uh yeah, and Nashville's Nashville's pretty cool as well. But yeah. I love I love living. I am not. I mean, you know, if if I win the lotto, I'm just gonna buy a bigger house in North Carolina. I really like it. You here. love it. What what yeah. brought you out to North Carolina? I thought when I moved out here, I was gonna do more work with racing, which just wasn't the case. Mm -hmm. But then I was like, wait a minute, I I I'm renting this house for you know a quarter of what I was paying in L.A. Oh, and then I God, like, yeah. wait, a wait a minute, I can buy a house here like a like a real house and and that was i bought this house probably about four or five years ago and it's already doubled it's mm -hmm. like it's insane here Be, but it's still cheap it's like here if you buy a house that costs a million dollars it looks like you live in a million dollar house mm -hmm. you know if you're in la and you buy a house that's a million dollars you still have to have bars on your window yeah yeah no you're right i live in uh i'm out here in myrtle beach so okay. not far from you, about three hours, I think. Right. Dirty Myrtle. Yeah. yeah. So it's the same way. When I moved here, I grew up in Tampa. Okay. So, and then from there, I moved out to California, Bakersfield, not LA, but an hour, an hour away from. Bakersfield shouldn't even be called California. <laughs> right. It's bad, right? Right. <laughs> but then, and so from there, I came out here and, uh, you know, we like it here. Myrtle Beach is great. Carolina is it's not bad. I know some people that are from Bakersfield. Bakersfield's all right. And Bakersfield had a good music scene a long, long, long time ago. And um, yeah, I didn't I, like it. I was in a band that played. I think Battery Club played in Bakersfield. I'm, I think at a restaurant or something. There was a know. pizza place there that used to have bands downstairs. What was it called? I don't remember. I don't, I don't know. Remember. I think I played there because I think like in between songs you heard like clanking of silverware and stuff. Maybe because like I know they had a lot of punk bands play there and stuff. And that probably would have been it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know they played a restaurant in Bakersfield. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, so now you're over here. Now you're getting ready to go on Ricky's ride on Monday, right? A couple of days from the time yeah, of recording. Yeah, it's now this. called it's now called the Ride Twenty Two. Okay. Because for the past two rides, Leah has done all or most of it with me. And, you know, she's bigger on social media than I am. And uh, so we just called it the ride at 22. And I leave Monday, I'm going to be riding from North Carolina through Virginia, through whatever other states I go through to get to Laconia, New Hampshire. It's about a thousand miles away. And then I'm going to ride to Portland, Maine. And Leah's going to meet me there. We're going to have lobster. And then we're going to go out Boston cream pie in Boston. And then we're going to go, go to Salem where the Salem witch trials were. And then we're going to go to Rhode Island. And then we're going to go to Amish country in Virginia. And then in August, we're going to ride from North Carolina up to Sturgis, up to Washington, Oregon, California. I mean, Whoa. we're going to, we're going to ride 10,000 miles. Wow. Now, yeah. what is the, do you do this for a charity or what, what? What is this for? Every year, there's a designated charity. Okay. Every penny that gets donated goes to the charity, which means that I pay for the ride myself, which, you know, I have a good sponsor. Law Tigers helps us. Law Tigers are motorcycle attorneys, mm -hmm. but I need other sponsors because it costs me about 20 grand to do these things because mm -hmm. every penny that's donated goes right to the charity. And I always pick a charity that I know can use the money and will use the money. And last in 2020, um, I gave a check to 20 for $22,000 to the Alzheimer's Association. 
The year before that, I gave a check for $32,000 for Stop Soldier Suicide. And this year, I'm raising money for the Victory Junction Camp, which is a camp for kids with serious illnesses and whether they have cancer or spina bifida or whatever, these kids go to this incredible camp and they get to do all these things that are tailored for them. And they see other kids like them with the same diseases or illnesses. So they see peers and the camp doesn't cost the kids anything. The camp doesn't cost their parents anything. And these kids, all they think about is being kids and um, people can go to the ride 22.com and I've already raised $18,000. So my goal before was 20 grand. We're going to pass that. So um, it's really, really cool. And then like, you know, when people buy cat house shirts or whatever, some of the money from that goes to pay the gas and the hotels and everything like that. So and we all know how gas is now. Oh my God. Like I'm scared. Yeah. Like already I look, I'm like, wait a minute. I just rode 2000 and I built 2000 miles. And why have I already spent 900 bucks? And I stay <laughs> cheap hotels. I'm like, just even to fill this Indian motorcycle is expensive now. And, and thank God the bike gets, you know, pretty good gas mileage. But I'm really excited. And this year, what we're going to be doing is I have live tracking so people can see wherever we are. But this year, what we're going to be doing is the company Senna has these Bluetooth devices. So we can so we talk to each other whenever we ride because she rides on the back. But it also has a camera. So we're going to be filming and recording. So we'll be talking while we're filming and you'll see what we see. And like, you know, in August, we're going to be at Custer State Park. And the last time we were there, we were surrounded by buffalo. You know, so it's, there's just so much, you know, this country's rad, you know, yeah. I mean, this country is pretty awesome and there's some really cool people. And when we're on the ride, a lot of times we go to places and people come out to meet us and, you know, it it happens a lot in Cleveland and it happens in, in so many places where these people, a lot of bikers, a lot of rockers, a lot of whatever. And it's just like, we've met like good, you know, we, we were in, in Roanoke, Virginia, and it was real late at night. And we pulled into some gas station, there were bugs and everything. And there was a couple that was following our, our live tracking. And they're like, Hey, how you doing? And they're like, Hey, you, you want to get some Italian food? We'll buy. And we're like, okay. And so we sat at a restaurant with these two people that we'd never met before. And it was awesome. That's it's so like, fun. You know, it, and that, that's what I really love is that, that, that we have, you know, there's a group that calls themselves the Rack Pack. And they're just a group of just like, just like the best people in the world. And they're so supportive and they help the cause and they help. And, you know, whenever we come out with a coffee, they buy it or a t-shirt, they buy it. And then if we're going to be in their area, they try to find places to stay or whatever. And we've gotten to meet a lot of these people. And it's just like, you know, I don't have a million followers, but I might have like 45,000 really great ones, you know? Yeah, yeah. And that's why I don't, it's, it's, it's really cool. It's really, really cool. Sounds like a blast. Now I know you've been riding forever, right? Has Leah, did she ride before she met you? She rides on the back of my bike. Right, that's still she riding. No, no. Yes, it is. Not really. Like when I met her, I said, look, um, just so you know, I, I, I'm, a, I'm a biker and I, I like to ride motorcycles a lot. And she's like, oh, cool. You know, I've been on a bike. Like, I think she rode like a little bit. I go, like, I like to ride a real lot. And she's like, okay, I go, I'm going to go on a ride. Do you want to ride with me? And it was like 500 miles of San Francisco. And we had a riot. And then I'm like, okay, well, I'm going to go ride, you know, whatever. Do you want to go with me? And she's like, okay. And she ended up being on the back of my bike for two months. Wow. So, so we both really love it because, you know, she's a tattoo artist. And her job, she's booked solid. So her job is hyper-focused. You know, you can't just kind of go through the motions when you're tattooing somebody. So she's hyper-focused. And she also works with a coffee company with me. And and with all my jobs, I'm always hyper-focused. So when we're on a bike, it's like, you can't do anything else except like pay attention and see what's going on around you and see the world. And I'm like, I'm hungry. And so she's behind me and she's like, well, check it out. There's this uh, donut shop 50 miles away that, that's got five stars. And I'm like, where is it? And she's like, okay, go up there. So she's like my navigator and yeah. we look for crazy places. And we've, I mean, just in the 2000 miles that we've done so far, we went hang gliding for the first time in Outer Banks. We went to a donkey sanctuary and, uh, you know, we do some just incredible, incredible things. That's awesome, man. That's awesome. 
All right, Ricky. Well, what else? Um, so people can go to Cat House Hollywood for merchandise. Please buy stuff from cathousehollywood.com so I can afford to get a better <laughs> website because I built that website and I know it sucks. And <laughs> Cat House Coffee will be available on the website very, very soon. And um, Cat House Coffee is good. Just buy a bag and you're going to like it. I, if you like coffee, you are going to like it. We have one blend that we're releasing that's a dark roast that's just so freaking good. And, um, and I mean, me and Leah were there for the roasting. We spent 12 hours today designing the bag. Mm. So it's, it's the, I mean, it'd be a lot easier for us just to go with the company and say, Hey, you design all this, you do it for us. And then we get a check, but I don't want to do that. Like I want to be a big part of it. So we experiment with the beans and the roasting and, and it's just, it's very, very exciting, and I'm, I'm, I, I can't wait for people to try it. And I hope you seem to it. do that with all your stuff. You take it upon yourself to handle it. That's my biggest fault. I was going to say that's good and bad. It's bad. It's yeah. bad. Like, like I don't know how to boost a post. I don't know how. Like, I wish somebody was working in my office that that handled. I mean, I have I have this girl Karen that works for me. That she's just an awesome, and and she loves everything that the brand stands for but we are both very limited in our knowledge of how to do things. It's like, you know, I have to call in some people to help me with inventory and I don't know how to make a website work. And I don't know how to do any of this stuff. I don't know anything about marketing. It's a miracle that I'm working on this stuff. But right now is the point, like, I'm going to start looking for people. I'm going to look for people that know how to do all this stuff mm -hmm. because I don't know how to do it. I, yeah. I bullshit my way into everything and, and that's also if somebody gets a message if there's something that you really really want to do bullshit and brilliance you know just just really really believe in what you're doing and and i do everything that i stand behind i really really believe but i know that i'd be better at it if i if i designate i'm not good at designating mm -hmm. but i have to look i mean the ride 22 i don't have a publicist the fact that i've raised almost a quarter of a million dollars and nobody knows and and meanwhile yeah. They're, they're advertising another benefit with a bunch of rockers that don't even ride motorcycles, but I don't have a publicist. So nobody knows about what I do, you know? So it, it sometimes bumps me out, but that's not why I do it. Yeah. But I'm, I'm very proud of what I've done, but I really wish I had somebody else helping me with this stuff because I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> how can somebody donate? If, if someone's listening right now and they want to donate to your ride, how can they do that? If they go to the ride 22.com, the website is a little bit outdated because I made the website. <laughs> it's the ride 22.com and they can donate every penny. It's tax deductible. It's a 501 C three. Um, every penny that they donate goes right to the victory junction camp. If you want to help support the ride, um, there's a ride 22 hat you can buy and that helps cover expenses or just buy something from cat house. I mean, if you buy cat house shirts, indirectly that helps the ride if you buy sure. a cat out coffee yeah that helps with all the other thing that's my living expenses but also if i sell you know five thousand bags of coffee it's a lot easier to pay for all these hotels on the road yeah so, yeah, yeah because you, you don't do a patreon or anything like that to get money you just you sell your merchandise and that's it uh, i don't know how to do a patreon <laughs> if, I, <laughs> if i did i i, I should but you know, I'm sure I will. No, no, then no, I'm not. I'd no, like not. to. I'd like to, but you know, I also like doing chats whenever I want to do chats, like on the ride 22. If you follow my Instagram, Facebook, or Twitter, or Leah's, we're going to be doing a live chat, a lot of live chats on our social media, and you don't have to pay for that kind of stuff. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. if you want to pay, subscribe to the Co Cat House Coffee Club and get a free bag of coffee. Not a free bag. You're not going to get a. <laughs> bag well yeah you're gonna get free but you have to spend 20 bucks something a month or whatever it's gonna be but um you know instead of doing a patreon just support the other stuff buy cat house stuff or buy cat coffee or don't it, it's it's tough if you can do all the things that we do for free and not buy anything i don't care just have fun yeah yeah cool man well i'm gonna put all the links in the show notes of this podcast so if people listening want they can click right on those links and get to you good 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 all right, man. Well, listen, I appreciate the time. Thank you for buying a cat house shirt. Yeah, man. Got to support. Okay. okay thanks, buddy. I hey, appreciate it. 